the believers at Corinth. And you remember that he had given a challenge to those in Corinth who denied the resurrection, who denied resurrection. And Paul brings a telling argument to those who are denying the possibility that Christ was risen. And he intends to let them know that if that were true, then his preaching that he had declared to them was vain. And their faith was vain. There was nothing, nothing to be gained by their believing that Christ had risen from the dead and that they too would rise from the dead if indeed there was no resurrection. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you hear Paul's words when he said, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, our faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Jesus are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And if we stop there, it's a dark picture indeed, is it not? Paul is simply saying it is all empty. There is no hope. But it's in verse 20 that he bursts forth with those words of praise. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. One little word. But upon that little word hinges the hope of all the ages. In that word, we see what God has provided to us because it turns the picture completely around. And then when we get to the close of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, we read, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Paul could well have said at that point, because he lives, we too shall live. That little word, but. You remember in John chapter 1 and verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But, verse 12 says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And then you recall in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want you to turn with me again here to Matthew chapter 28. In verses 5 through 7, we're told, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you, he is not here. Of course he's not there. The resurrection has taken place. He's not still on the cross. He's not in the tomb. The only plausible explanation is what God gives to us. He is risen as he said. Time and again, he had told not only his disciples, but his enemies. 
that he was going to move through the avenue of death, but that he would be raised from that death. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 40, then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 31, And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say, Elias, and others, one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days <coughs> rise again. Luke chapter 24, verses 6 through 8. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. John chapter 2. Early in the ministry of our Lord, and as he has entered into the house of the Lord to cleanse the temple, and he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. They had been told time and time and time again of what events were ahead in the life of our Lord. But it's four little words life-changing words that I want you to think about this morning. We've looked at them before, but I want to deal with them more extensively this morning, cause our minds to think of what is being said by the angels to the women who came to the tomb. Four little words. Come, see, go, tell. The whole story. The whole thing is wrapped up in those words. God has always had a message to sinners that is contained in that word, come. Come. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, he says to Israel, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In another place, in Isaiah 55, the Lord says, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Later, he says, incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. 
when we get to the New Testament, God's message doesn't change. The invitation is still there. The word is still given. In Matthew chapter 19, they brought little children to the Lord for him to lay his hand upon them and bless them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. You remember what Jesus said? Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. In John chapter 7 and verse 37, at the Feast of Tabernacles, the last day of the feast, in that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me. Let him come. And how can we forget Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29? Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. We desperately need rest. Rest of soul. Oh, there are times that it is rest of body. This life is exacting. It's exhausting, and we long for rest. But there's also the rest of soul and spirit. And the word is, come. Come unto me. You that are in need of that rest, of that care, of that provision, come unto me. That's the message that the angels speak. Come. Come. See. Go. Tell, Lord, let my mind be at peace. Let me just rest in the comfort of your word. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. The message hasn't changed by the time we get it to the end of the, Old, of the New Testament scriptures. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst, come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Come. That's the message. That's the message to these women as they gather at the grave with preparation to, to complete the preparations of the body of our Lord for that tomb. And the angels say, come, come. And surely you have noted that it's always God who seeks us and not the other way around. God seeks sinners and he seeks his own people. It was God seeking Adam when he came to the garden after Adam had sinned. And it was God who said, Adam, where art thou? Ah, I knew I was naked and I hid. God was seeking. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus is in Jericho. There's a little man by the name of Zacchaeus who is in a sycamore tree. He's wanting to have a vantage point from which he can see the Lord as he passes through that area. And our Lord stops and addresses him and begins to deal with him. And Zacchaeus is told, come down. I'm going to your house today. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And how we must thank God that he does seek 
that he sought Adam, that he says he will seek and save that which is lost. Because in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, as it is written, there is none the righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. That's the condition of the unsaved heart, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an echo of those words in Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3, where David writes, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They have done, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And yet, as children of God, we are encouraged to draw near to God. James says it in James chapter 4, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hand, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. God is encouraging us to come and he is the one who is seeking us, looking for those who will follow him. Psalm 34, 10, the young lions do lack and see and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Psalm 105 and verse 4 says, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face evermore. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 11, seek the Lord and his strength seek his face continually we are called to seek him and we are called to come to him and then notice that the angelic message was see see what see the place where the Lord lay see the place Aren't you glad they were not invited to come in and see the body of our Lord? See the place where he lay. What they're talking about is empirical evidence. There is empirical evidence that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Empirical evidence means that it can be observed. It's something that can be seen and it can be engaged in understanding through experiment. So here we have an angel saying to these women, come in, look, see, observe, if you will. And what would they observe? Well, they observed grave clothes that were undisturbed. They observed a napkin that had been around the head that was folded and by itself. We're told in John chapter 20, verses 4 through 8, speaking of John and of Peter. So they ran both together, and the other disciples did out, the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothed lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothed, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. Empirical evidence. Come, see. There is evidence that can be seen that Christ rose from the dead. 
And when they looked at the grave clothes, how different it was from what is described concerning Lazarus when Jesus raised him from the dead. And in his resuscitation, he comes forth bound hand and foot by the grave clothes, and Jesus must say to the people, loose him and let him go. That's not the case with the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The grave clothes are there, but again, it is part of the empirical evidence that he has risen. There's the testimony of the women. They saw and heard, they saw the angelic messengers and they heard the message. Empirical evidence. They knew what their eyes had seen. They knew what God had given them as to an understanding of what had taken place. Furthermore, the stone was rolled away. That had been a discussion. Who will roll away the stone for us? The stone was rolled away, and the women didn't do it. Luke records for us, in Luke 24, verses 1 and 2, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. The question arises then, for the skeptic, the one who says that Christ did not rise from the dead, who moved the stone? Who moved the stone? In fact, there was a book written by a Frank Morrison of that very title. Who moved the stone? Matthew 28 and verse 2. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Verses 3 through 5, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. I mentioned Frank Morrison. Who moved the stone? His real name was Albert Henry Ross. He was an English advertising agent and freelance writer known for writing this particular book, Who Moved the Stone? And the book analyzes the biblical texts about the events related to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. He began to write it as a skeptic. He did not believe the accounts that were given concerning Christ rising from the dead. But as he began to work more and more and deeper and deeper into what the Word of God said, he became convinced that the truth of the resurrection was indeed the truth that Christ had risen from the dead. And so he wrote his book that he had intended to be a short paper dealing with Christ, the final phase. But he finally had to write a book that was entitled, Who Moved the Stone? Come, see. There is empirical evidence here for you to see. Look at what has taken place. See the grave clothed. See the stone rolled away. Understand that those grave clothes are undisturbed by the body. They're not unwrapped. They're undisturbed because a body is passed through them. A napkin taken and placed to the side. See, see what God has evidenced, but you have to come in order to see that. And then that next little word, and there's urgency to it, go. 
Go quickly. Go quickly. This is good news. You have something to tell others. You have a message to report. And it's the very message given by the Lord to the disciples prior to his ascension. Again, in Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you Alway, even unto the end of the world or the age. Amen. Prior to his ascension, he reminds them of this very thing. I want you to go. You have a message to carry. Mark records it in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. When we get to Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power. That word power speaks of authority, of jurisdiction, of right. God is placed within his own jurisdiction, the times and the seasons. You and I know the predictions that have been made, but we do not know the time and the season when those things will come to pass. We cannot predict it's going to be this day because God has reserved that to himself. It is his right. It is his authority. It is his jurisdiction. But Jesus said to his disciples, ye shall receive power. Different word, dunamis, now is used and it means ability, strength. This God will do. He will give you the ability and the strength to carry the message and to be witnesses for me. In all of these places, simultaneously, even unto the ends of the earth. Going is implied. He doesn't use the term go in that particular passage, but that going is implied for how can you be a witness in these places if you don't go so the women are told go quickly tell his disciples his disciples in acts chapter 1 and verse 9 we then read and when he had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and finally, that fourth little word that is life-changing is the word tell. Tell. That's a simple word, isn't it? Tell. We tell a lot of things, do we not? Some of us, not all, some are more gregarious than others, but by and large, we will discover that we do like the sound of our voice and we like to talk and tell others, but this is something special. Go, tell. This is good news. When you have good news, you dare not keep it to yourself. It's meant to be shared. The word of God concerning the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ must be declared. And so the women are told, go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. 
And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. It's what Paul declared to the Corinthians through which they were saved. It was good news. A good message. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Moreover, brethren, Paul says, I declare unto you. The word declare is a simple word. It's, it means to make known. Make known. It's not simply that he's saying the words, but in the process of saying the words, he is making known unto them the gospel which I preached. And that word means to announce good news, especially the gospel. The gospel message that Paul will delineate here is good news. It is a good message, and it was preached unto you, which also ye have received. You have received it. Well, Paul, it, yes, it came into my brain. It came in through the ear gate. I have received it in that sense. But that's not what Paul is saying. The word that he uses to speak of receiving is a word that means received near. It means associated with oneself. It's an intimate act. These People at Corinth heard the message, they believed the message, they received the message, it came near to them, it was an intimate act of taking it in, in association with themselves, and therefore Paul could say to them, wherein ye stand. You received it, you made it intimately yours, and by it you stand by which also you're saved. You've been redeemed. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered, I delivered, I delivered. Again, it's not just, hey, I announced a message to you. When he says, I delivered, he uses a word that means I entrusted to you. I yielded up to you. I committed to you. First of all, of supreme importance, that which also, which I also received. Now, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Here are the witnesses. Here are those that speak of the fact that he is risen from the dead. In the biblical account, in the book of Luke, chapter 24, we're told about a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, a believer in Jesus Christ came to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus, took it down, wrapped it, and placed it in his sepulcher. It was the day of preparation, meaning the Sabbath was coming near. The women had followed after, and they noted the place where Jesus was laid. They noticed the placement of the body in that tomb because they had a purpose. They were going to come back with spices and ointments that would complete the responsibility of preparing the body 
for lying in the grave. And in Luke 24, we're told now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. They entered in, found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered, they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher to, and told all these things unto the 11 and to all the rest. And it was at that point that there was rejoicing in what had happened. Four simple, single words come come that's god's invitation he seeks us even the believer is sought by god to draw nigh to him and he says when you do i will draw nigh to you i will be with you so come and see there is empirical evidence Yes, we are to respond to God's message by faith. But it doesn't mean that there is no evidence of what God has done and what God has said. There is evidence. We need to look for that evidence. Instead of borrowing from the skeptics who say, there's nothing there. There's no way we could believe that. Well, believe me, you study the evidence, consider it carefully, do the work of a biblical detective, and there is no way that you can not believe what he has said. Life-changing words, come, see, go, tell. For the unsaved, they're called to new life in Christ if they'll simply receive by faith the redemptive work of Christ, believing his death and burial and resurrection have provided salvation for them. And to the saved, to the saved, the message is come, come near, see for yourselves. Go with urgency. Tell everyone, young and old, rich and poor, men and women, Jew and Gentile, everyone, Christ died for your sins. Christ was buried. Christ rose again from the dead. And all of that happened in accordance with the scriptures. It is based not on hearsay, it is based not on circumstantial evidence. It is based upon God's truth. And it is seen in what God has done and provided. So this morning, we must come with that cry upon our lips, He is risen! And out of that, our response to one another should be, He is risen Indeed, it is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is our redemption that has been provided through him. Have you received that? If you have, then this morning rejoice. If you haven't, then hear God's word right now. His invitation, come, come. 
and see. And then when you have come and seen, go and tell. Four simple words, but they are life-changing words. And I trust that our hearts and lives have been, will be changed because of what he has done. Jonathan, if you would, please.